want to speak uh, directly from Ludwig Ott's Doctrinal Distinctions of the Church. And in God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Each of the three persons possesses the one numerical divine essence. The terms essence, nature, and substance refer to the divine being, which is the same for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. While the term hypostasis and person refer to the three owners or bearers of the divine being. The Nicene Creed, which arose out of the defensive struggle against Arianism, especially stressed the true divinity of the Son and his consubstantiality with the Father. This historic teaching of the Christian Church is that there is one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a teaching that can be found framed within the historical Word of God, yet not limited to the written Word of God. Do not confuse his, confuse his teaching for that of my friend, Mr. Ritchie, which is aptly titled Modalism. Modalism claims that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are really three manifestations of the same person, appearing in different modes. This doctrine has come to be called modalism, and in the last century or so, a modern form of modalism is often called the oneness or Jesus only doctrine. My opponent makes a number of claims to support this teaching that has been condemned as heresy by the early church. But first, we must outline the early creed that not only affirms the doctrine of the Trinity, but is also absolutely biblical and historical. The Nicene Creed, we will find, is the summation of the Word of God. We will then see how the historical Word of God stands in clear opposition to modalism. The Creed begins with, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God who not made consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and, our, and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried and rose again on the third day. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Please listen to that carefully. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, John 16, 7, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 11, Ephesians 3, 5. I believe in one holy and Catholic, Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So what is this creed affirming? Ludwig Ott so eloquently puts it, There is only one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God, the Son or Lord is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is the person, the Son is the person, and the Holy Spirit is the person. Not in the regular, normal English manner which we speak, or even Spanish, but it's not, not in that manner either. The Father is the person we can have fellowship with. Him. He knows, he teaches, he loves, he is a witness, he has a will. The Son is the person we can have fellowship with. Him. He knows, he teaches, he loves, he has a witness, he has a will. The Holy Spirit is the person we can have fellowship with. Him. He knows, he teaches, he loves, he is a witness, he has a will. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are personally distinct from one another. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are able to be, are able to send or be sent by one another. Speak to each other and, and about each other. The Father and the Son love and honor each other. The Trinity doctrine, that there is one God in three persons, summarizes these biblical and historical truths without add, adding or subtracting from them. Modalists often make the fatal assumption that the word God has the meaning of one divine person, although it, that is not biblical. Trinitarians do not assume this. To the Trinitarian, the word God can denote any or all of the divine persons, depending, of course, on the context. The same assumption is made about the meaning of other words. For example, modalism takes the word spirit to mean one person who is a spirit, Lord to mean one person who is Lord. As Father Adasa puts it, although the unity of God is the main theme of the Old Testament, in some, some passages the multi-personal nature of God is certainly suggested. <coughs> Here's me. However, it is the New Testament that we find the fullest, clearest revelation of the concept summarized in the doctrine of the Trinity. The Gospel of John begins like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. First, the Word was God. The Word had the character and nature of God. 
what God was, the Word was. Second, the personal pronoun him is applied to the Word, indicating that the Word is a personal being. Third, the Word was with God. The term with indicates that the Word was not the same person as the one with whom he was. He was one who was also referred to as God. John 1, 14, 17, 18 further explained the identity of the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. As you read the rest of the first chapter of John's Gospel, it begins to become clear that God in verse 1 is God the Father, and the Word who is with Him is God the Son. Other passages of Scripture confirm that the Father and the Son are not the same person. For example, the Son prays to the Father in Matthew ch chapter 26, calls in His Father as a second witness, and sits down with His Father on the throne in Revelation 3.21. I cannot wait till we get to Revelation 3.21. The scriptures also reveal the existence of a third divine person, the Holy Spirit. As Jesus spoke with his disciples, excuse me, in John 14, 16, he made it quite clear that the Holy Spirit was not the same person as himself. I hope you listen carefully when my opponent brings up argument after argument, because in oneness theology, they don't have a whole lot of significant verses. One significant verse of theirs they like to use is calling Christ the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Father. This means that he is the Father, they say. Or, as I've heard brought up numerous times, vice versa. It is argued that the arm of the Lord proves that they are, in their divinity, one and the same person. The prophecy which is echoed in the Gospel of John reads, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. In the Gospel of John, this prophecy is attributed to Christ being the arm. The verses preceding with this passage which speaks of the arm show that two different persons are being spoken of. The fact that Christ is the arm of the Father, yet the two, two distinct persons, is highlighted in John chapter 12, 44, which, believe, which says, Whoever believes in me, hopes you on ice and a, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Literally then saying, the one who sent me. Chapter 13 then says, Now the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Literally, he will leave this world and go towards the Father. Notice the usage of the two articles in the passage. Ha Jesus con patera. Two completely different persons. As my time is winding up, I do not have time to continue my opening statement, but I will wrap it up by pointing out that another popular argument brought up within the oneness circles is John chapter 1030, which says, I and, the fa and the, my Father are one. They say that this can only mean that Jesus is the Father, but we will see that historical, the historical witness does not hold up in regards to this explanation. I will now wrap up my opening statement. Thank you. All right, thank you for that opening. And now we will have uh, Stephen Ritchie, who holds the one this position, and he is going to have his eight-minute opening. Great. Yes, thank you, Gus, for hosting and moderating the debate, and thank you, uh, Michael Albrecht, for your participation. One is Pentecostals believe in the historic modalistic monarchian theology, which according to Tertullian, was held by the majority of believers in the first days of Christianity. We do not believe in dynamic monarchianism, which denies the deity of Christ. We believe in the historic modalistic monarchian theology, which was held by the vast majority of Christians within the first few centuries of the Christian era, including the earliest bishops of Rome. We believe that the one true God is the Father. The Heavenly Father is a single monarch as one eternal king, who has manifested himself by his own word and by his own Holy Spirit, which are different modes of God the Father's own omnipresent being emanating from himself. Therefore, we believe that God entered into a new existence when his word became flesh and when his Holy Spirit incarnated himself as the fully human Son of God. Matthew one twenty informs us that the angel said, That which is conceived in her, in Mary, is of the Holy Spirit. So it was the Holy Spirit who conceived the Christ child within the Virgin Mary, rather than an alleged heavenly God the Son person. Luke one thirty five informs us that the Holy Spirit descended upon the Virgin, came over the Virgin Mary, and for this reason... The Holy Child was called the Son of God. For what reason was the Son of God called the Son of God in the first place? Because the Holy Spirit performed the act of the Incarnation Himself, 
within the Virgin Mary to conceive the Christ child. Therefore, it was the Holy Spirit who performed the act of the Incarnation himself within the embryo of the Virgin Mary, rather than an alleged pre-incarnate heavenly God, the Son person. Therefore, if a trinity was true, the wrong divine person performed the Incarnation. We should see a heavenly God, the Son, coming over the Virgin Mary. Instead, we see the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of the one true God, the Father. Because there's only one Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father of all, through all, and in us all, according to Ephesians 4. I challenge my opponent to cite a single verse to show that an alleged pre-incarnate heavenly God, the Son person, entered the Virgin to perform the Incarnation. Therefore, the titles Son of God and Son of Man, Son of Mankind through Mary, are incarnational titles only for the human child that was born and the human son that was given rather than being titles for an alleged heavenly pre-incarnate God the Son person. I challenge my opponent to present a single verse of scripture that gives us the reason why the Son is called the Son of God other than the New Testament reason given in Luke one thirty-five. Luke one thirty-five says that which is conceived uh, in her is of the Holy Spirit and for this reason the Holy Child was called the Son of God. Colossians 2.9 informs us that all of the fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus in bodily form. Since all means all, Jesus must be the full incarnation of all the deity of the only true God, the Father. Because Jesus said that the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. John 14.10 I challenge Mr. Albrecht to cite a single verse to show that an alleged heavenly God the Son dwelt in Jesus to do the works. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He never said, he that has seen me has seen the eternal Son. John 17, 3 informs us that the Father is the only true God. John 4, 23, 24 states that the only true God is alone seeking true worshipers to worship him, not them. For Jesus said, God is a spirit, one spirit. And they that worship him must worship him, not them, in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks true worshipers to worship Him. So since there's only one true God, the Father, Jesus is called God, the Holy Spirit is called God, they must be modes, manifestations, or emanations of the only true God, the Father Himself. 1 Timothy 2.5 proves that there is one God, who is the Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we have one God, who is the Father, one divine person, and one human person. That explains the relationship between the Father and the Son. We don't see that in the Old Testament. We only find the relationship between the Father and the Son after the Incarnation. Because God said, I will be a Father to the Son, and the Son will be a Son to me. Hebrews 1.5 The words, God the Father, appear 31 times in the Greek New Testament. But we never find the words God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Why is this? Because there's only one true God the Father. Therefore, since Jesus and the Holy Spirit are called God, they must be manifestations or emanations of that only true God the Father himself who came to save us. Hebrews 1.3 states that the Son is the radiance of his glory, the Father's glory, and the exact imprint or exact representation of his, the Father's, substance of being imprinted as a human being. The Greek word character literally means an exact imprint or an exact representation as the exact copy of an original. The context of Hebrews chapter 1 proves that the Son is the character as the exact imprinted copy of the Father's substance of being as a human being. If words mean anything, the word character proves that the Son had to have had been made as an exact imprinted copy of the Father's being at a specific point in time. Psalm 2.7 informs us when the Son was actually imprinted as the copy of the Father's substance of being. When God said, you are my Son, this day have I begotten you. What day was Jesus actually begotten? When he was born at Bethlehem, for he could not have been begotten twice. Therefore, the titles Son of God and Son of Man are incarnational titles only for the man Christ Jesus, rather than for an alleged pre-existent heavenly God the Son person. 1 Peter 1.20 states that he, Jesus, was foreknown before the creation of the world. The Greek word for foreknown is prognosko, which means to know beforehand. The same Greek word prognosko is used in Romans 8.29. 
for whom he foreknew, prognosco, for those whom he foreknew or knew beforehand, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So since God's elect were foreknown, prognosco, so Jesus was foreknown, prognosco, before the world was created. Now we're not saying that Jesus is not God. That he who became manifest in the flesh is the Holy Spirit of God, the Father himself, becoming a man to save us. Uh, so I challenge Mr. Albrecht to explain how Jesus could have literally existed as a son before being foreknown. Because the word foreknow means to know beforehand. It's impossible for Jesus to have literally existed before being foreknown. Otherwise, the word foreknown is meaningless. Ephesians 1 4 states that in him, in Christ, you were chosen from the creation of the world. It is in this sense that God's word says that Jesus had glory before the world was, because even God's elect had glory before the world was. In Romans 8 29, verse 30, it says, uh, Those whom he predestined, he also glorified. So God's elect were foreknown, Romans 8 29, 30. They were also glorified just as Jesus had glory, predestined glory before the world was. God bless. Oh, very well. Okay, so now we will begin with the two rebuttal periods, which have been extended to six minutes each. And, uh, and are, are you all able to hear me better now? Uh, you still sound... Still a little old, but I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Just make we, sure. we can hear you clear, but you just sound a little distant. So shout. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I will try to speak louder, and I will get myself another mic for the next debate. I apologize for this. Yeah, it, it could be that, uh, oh, I don't know if you're using a mic or, then, uh, I don't know, the receiver, if you were using a phone, I would, if you were using a phone, I would definitely tell you that you need to hold the receiver closer to your mouth. Yeah, uh, you're not using a mic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, but, um. You know, you, 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 you're being heard clear, it's just you sound a little okay. distant. Great, great. Okay, so the, um, uh, these are six-minute rebuttals, and you can start your rebuttal now. Great. Thank you for that opening, Mr. Ritchie. I appreciate that. I want to start off by, um, by making one quick comment. Mr. Ritchie made a comment in his opening statement in regards to the bishops of Rome for the first two centuries all believe in oneness theology, he says, and I've heard him bring up this argument before uh, in debate, and uh, I, I was under the impression that we were not going to uh, bring up the early church, but, you know, it, it, that's really fine. It's kind of hard to not bring up, uh, you know, uh, commentaries and what have you. So uh, if Mr. Ritchie would like to challenge me on the bishops of Rome or anybody in the early church believing in modalism in the cross-examination period, I would w welcome that. Because I would argue uh, that there is no evidence for such. Um, the arguments that he brings up, uh, I've heard him bring up Tertullian, Hermes, and uh, several others before. They, they just don't hold water. But anyway, um, Mr. Ritchie says that, um, that, they, that they, the word uh, karakar, the Greek word, means an exact representation. Uh, at least that's uh, the gist of what I got and what he was saying. And uh, I, I didn't quite understand exactly what he was saying there because of that Greek word that means uh, son of father. I'm not exactly certain. Uh, perhaps he will cross-examine me on that and we can get that a little more uh, clearly down. I don't really understand that, but uh, the Greek word kalatar is used in a number of different ways and it just doesn't hold water the way Mr. Ritchie's using it. Uh, Mr. Ritchie tells us that the Bible never says God the Son. Well, the Bible tells us the Son is Yahweh. The Bible doesn't have to use the exact terminology and Mr. Ritchie demands that use it, because we're told that, that, that Christ is our great God and Savior. He's our mighty God. The Bible gives us exclusive words to, that tell us to worship Christ, the person, as God. To give him latria is an exclusive term for worship. Excuse me. And in the same note, telling us to give that divine honor, divine worship, to the Father as well, showing us two distinct persons there. Mr. Ritchie uses Hebrews 1.3, and that he, I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, Hebrews 1.3 is, is no friend of Mr. Mr. Ritchie's at all. Hebrews 1.3 is actually one of the most uh, damaging points to modalism that Mr. Ritchie can ever bring up. Because Hebrews 1.3 tells us this, and I'm going to read it. Who is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, and who sustains all things by his mighty word, when he accomplished purification from sins, he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
Now look, and there, there are so many verses Mr. Ritchie brings out, it's impossible to cover them all in the six minute remodel period. But Hebrews 1.3 especially sticks out because interestingly enough, in Hebrews 1.3 we read, He is the radiance of the glory, He sustains all things, He accomplished purification, He took His seat at the right hand. He, 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 He. Who is this He? It's Christ. And this he that the Greek is connecting from the ancient Septuagint text is the eternal Christ. It is a person. The author of the book of Hebrews is interpreting wisdom to be speaking about a person. This person is the eternal life. Therefore, I, I, I would argue, actually, I don't argue, I'm pointing out, that that Greek term is very significantly connected to that verse in the Septuagint. This person, we're told, is eternal life. Therefore, one thing we can see in this verse, one clear thing is, the Son pre-existed as a person, He's being connected to that verse, we're shown he pre-existed as a person, pre-incarnation. The Son was divine, divine as Almighty God divine in that sense. Let us read Wisdom 7.26. For, for she is the refulgence in eternal life, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of its goodness. Like the book of Proverbs, wisdom here personifies the wisdom of God. The writer of Hebrews adopts this descriptive divine wisdom and directly applies it to Jesus. He is the refulgence of God's glory. And if Mr. Ritchie wants to argue that this is simply shown it's a part of the Father, we can get into the description of that Greek term for refulgence. The Greek word is seldom used and is actually very rare in Septuagintal and patristic usage. And as evidence will show, will show a palgasma, which is used here, is in this instance for glory, and in Wisdom 7.26, speaking, I'm glad Mr. Ritchie brought up uh, uh, bishops, fathers earlier, because the fathers, pre-Nicene, Nicene, post-Nicene, all of them post on this verse to show evidence for the eternal generation of the Son. Furthermore, of even greater interest is the usage of this passage and linking in ancient manuscripts. We must remember that Wisdom and its passages are used all throughout Scripture. All throughout Scripture. Going back to, uh, I believe Mr. Ritchie brought up the argument of, I think it was John 10.30, where it says, Christ, where Christ says, uh, I, I and the Father are one. I believe he brought that verse up. He also brought up uh, uh, John chapter 14, verse 9. John 10.30 is a very interesting verse. I don't have enough time to go into all of it. It is speaking about the equality of the divine power, which points to the unity of divine essence. John 14.9 tells us, he says, the verse actually reads this right here. It reads, uh, Have I been with you so long, so long a time with you, and yet you have not known me? So look, he that has seen me has seen the Father. The only thing that this can mean is Jesus and the Father are one, right? Well, not so. Because as Matthew 10, 40 tells us, He that receives me receives me, and he that receives me receives him that sent me. Was Jesus the same person as his disciples? Absolutely not. It's real simple to see what John 14.9 means, and all we have to do is see where Christ uses similar expressions. Similar expressions. We can see this. That is it for my uh, whole period. And we'll give way to Mr. Ritchie. Okay. Well, Mr. Ritchie, you have uh, a six-minute rebuttal period, and you can begin that right now. Okay, Hebrews 2. Uh, 2 verse 17 says that Jesus was made exactly like his brethren, fully human in every way. If we are to truly believe that God became a man, that means he was not just God in flesh. He was God as a human spirit with a human soul, a human mind, a human will. We believe that God could not be tempted of evil, neither does he tempt any man. So Jesus was not tempted as God. He was tempted as a true man. So when God became a man through the hypostatic union, deity from the Holy Spirit and humanity from Mary were united together as one human spirit with the two natures intact. Uh, my opponent used the right hand of God saying that, well, Jesus is a man, he's at the right hand of God, that means there's not has to be another co-equal God, the Son, person. But the Bible doesn't say this. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is only one God, who is the Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we have one divine person called the Father, and one human person called the man. But Jesus Christ was not just a man, he is Emmanuel, God with us as a man. Yahweh, who became our salvation. 
So modalistic monarchy and theology believes in everything that Mr. Albrecht had said. He spent a lot of time on the Nicene Creed, and uh, the Nicene Creed really doesn't go into the details of, the, of a co-equal, co-eternal trinity. That was developed in the late 5th century, and it was not actually written by Bishop Athanasius. The Father and Son could love each other. There's a distinction between the Father and Son because the Son had to love the Father. Because it wasn't God the Father dwelling in a man as God the Father. It was God the Father dwelling in a fully complete human being. That's how Jesus was tempted, and that's how Jesus had to have prayed. Because if God really did become a man, he had to have prayed. We do not believe in the Apollinarian view, where God just peered out through the eyes of humanity and pretended to pray. No, Jesus was a real man in every sense of the word man. So the Father could love the Son, and the Son could love the Father. But where is the text where the Father loved the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loved the Father throughout eternity past? And where is the text where Jesus loved the Father and the Father loved Jesus before the Incarnation? I challenge Mr. Albrecht to find that. There's only one Spirit of God. God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Ephesians 4, 3-6 says that there's only one Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father above all, through all, and in us all. Since there's only one Spirit, uh, Jesus Christ must be that one God, who became our salvation to save us. And that's the meaning of the arm of Yahweh revealed. It doesn't say heavenly God the Son's arm came to save us. It was the arm of the only true God the Father emanating from himself. And that's the teaching of modalistic monarchianism. Uh, there's only one God. And so John chapter 1 verse 1 speaks of the Logos. And Trinitarians do us a disservice when they translate John 1 2 as he. Because the word logos is not a person. The Greek word logos means the expressed thought of a human individual, or well, as well as God. For example, the heretical word of Hymenaeus and Philetus in 2 Timothy 2.17 is called the logos. We don't believe that the word of Hymenaeus and Philetus was another person beside them. So the logos it stands for the expressed thought of God, or the thought of a person. In fact, there's not a single example anywhere in the Greek New Testament where the Greek word logos denotes a human person. Mark 5, 35 through 36 states that Jesus heard the word, the logos, which was spoken by the messengers from the rulers of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? So the word from the ruler of the synagogue's house was a logos, not another person. Again, Matthew twenty-two forty-six 46 states that no one was able to speak a word a logos against Jesus. And again, Matthew 13, 8, when anyone hears the word, the logos of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away the word out of his heart. So the logos, the word of the kingdom, cannot be a person. It is the mind and plan and purpose of the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the logos, the express thought of God, and the Logos expressed thought of God was with God, and the expressed thought of God was God. Because God's words are spirit and they are life. John 6, 6.63 and Hebrews 4.12 says that the word, the Logos of God, is living. We find that in John 1.1, 1, 1, that, which, that which was from the beginning, not he who was from the beginning. And uh, we find that the first English translation directly from Erasmus' Greek text into English, was performed by William Tyndale in the early 16th century. And Tyndale wrote in John 1-2, it was from the beginning, referencing the Logos in John 1-1. So normally we find hotos in John 1-2 in the masculine singular. It's normally translated as a he. But the context must show that it is a he. For instance, Matthew 20, 15 says, Kai diifmete ho lagos hotos parayudios, which is, they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story, this lagos, hotos is translated as this and not he, because lagos is a story and not a person. God bless. Our time is up. Very good on the pie. Okay, well, this is the action period. This is the cross examinations. So we're going to have six, seven-minute cross exams, and William is going to have the first cross exam of Stephen Ritchie, and then we will have, uh, um, then uh, so on and so forth. Ritchie will cross exam. Uh, I believe we're going to have cross exams. Is that correct? Three each. Huh? 
question, do we have three each, three cross-examinations? We have three cross-exams each, and these have all been extended a minute, so these will be now seven-minute cross-exams, so you guys have uh, an extra minute of time to um, cross-exam one another. So, uh, you can begin your cross-exam right now, William, if you want. Great. Okay. Yes, I'll begin now. Okay, Mr. Ritchie, um, in Hebrews 1-3, um, who is the radiance of the Father's glory? Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory. Okay. Um, who is the person that, is, that sustains all things? Who is the person that what? Sustains all things. The only true God, the Father. Okay. Let's see. Um, who is the person that accomplished purification? Uh, Jesus Christ is our mediator, accomplished the atonement. Okay. And the individual that took his seat at the right hand... Who is that? That is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. As man, am I correct? Not yes. as deity? Yes. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It is the man who was born at Bethlehem, is now resurrected, is at the right hand of the Father. Okay. Um, in Hebrews 1.3, this is hearkening to Wisdom 7.26. The Greek word for apologosma, which is used for glory here, what is that word referring to in the Book of Wisdom? Okay, what's, what passage in Wisdom are you referring to again? I could tell 726. you. 7 26. Well, let, let me ask you a different question before you even go there. Uh, would you agree with me that the Book of Proverbs, like Wisdom, persona, persona, excuse me, personifies the Wisdom of God? Are we on the same wavelength in terms of that? Yes, metaphorically. Okay, great, yes, yes. I understood. Okay. So, my question to you is, if here, if the book of Hebrews is adopting the descriptive divine wisdom and directly applying it to Jesus, who is the glory? Literally, what is the glory being referred to in Wisdom 726? Wisdom 726. Yes. Okay, let me look at it real quick. Is, 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 this, glory, is this glory eternal, or is this glory, you know, merely... You know, not eternal, I guess. Okay, well, it says here, Wisdom 726, For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. That's what it says. So what was your Great. question? Okay, perfect. In Hebrews 1.3, in Hebrews 1.3, then applying this verse of eternal light to Christ, um, it doesn't say specifically uh, wisdom is personified. It, I don't see a direct reference. Uh, it could be uh, a reference to the Son of God. Okay, M Mr. Richard, did, did you not just tell me right now that the he being referred to of the radiance of the glory was Jesus Christ? Did you not just say that right now? Absolutely. Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory. Okay, so that goes right back to my question. Then, then this Greek word, apogosma, which is used here for glory, is being referred to Christ, am I correct? Uh, well, I don't know for sure about the Book of uh, Wisdom actually being Christ. Uh, I have uh, the Book of Wisdom, uh, for instance, Wisdom 8.2, Solomon called Wisdom a bride and was enamored I, of I her beauty, so that could I, not be Christ, because Christ is not the bride, we're the bride. God's elect of the bride. Right, I, oh, right, I understand that completely. That, that, that wasn't my question. My question was, let, let me try to explain it better. I apologize if I'm not uh, explaining too clearly. Um, are we both of the same mindset that Hebrews 1 3 is hearkening directly to Wisdom 726? Uh, I am not 100% sure on that. I will not speak if I do not know. It may be okay. a reference to the Son of God. Of course, Jesus is the image of the invisible God in Colossians 1.15, the firstborn over all creation. So prophetically, right. Jesus is the image of God, but he wasn't literally the image back before the incarnation. In God's mind, in right, Logos, right. he was already that image, but not until the fullness of time had come was he born of a woman. Yeah, not, not talk, we're not talking about an image at all. I was, I was asking if Hebrews 1.3, we're actually talking about a completely different, completely different Greek word. The Greek word is apogosma, which is used for glory. And I guess I'll, 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 I'll expand my question to you. Are you aware of this word that is used for glory or being used anywhere else in the Greek Old Testament or the Greek New Testament? 
No, I do not study Greek, Greek in the Septuagint. I, I am not aware of the Greek text in Septuagint. Okay, in the Greek New Testament, this Greek word for apaugasma, that is, that is pointing to Christ, is, is this used anywhere else in the Greek New Testament? I do not know. Okay. Let me try to go right back to what we were speaking of right now. Hebrews 1 3 says, who is, and I'll just, I, I, even though we both know what we're talking about in regards to glory, who is the refulgence of his glory? Hebrews 1 3 says that. Then wisdom uses basically the exact terminology for refulgence of eternal life. Are these two verses connected in any way whatsoever? Seeing as to seem to the fact that only these two verses use this very rare Greek word, would that not show that they are connected and that? The author of the book of Hebrews is hearkening to wisdom. Uh, maybe you could just explain that to me just a little bit so I can understand you. I, I'm not getting you. Okay. The, I, I, okay. The book of Hebrews tells us that Christ is the radiance of glory. Am I correct? Right. We, we, we both agree to that. The book of Hebrews is quoting, basically, not verbatim, but using words that are found exclusively in Wisdom 726, which speaks of eternal light. Is Hebrews 1 3 speaking about a person? It is hard to this with him 726. Is it speaking about the person of Christ in, in Hebrews 1 3? When it says the refulgence of his glory, is that a person, or is that, is that the person of Christ, or is that the Father that's being spoken of there? Well, again, uh, wisdom is personified. I'm not saying wisdom is a direct person. Because Wisdom 7.25 says that wisdom is a breath of the power of God, a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. So wisdom is a breath of the power of God. So wisdom could not have been a person before the incarnation. In God, God's mind, in God's prophetic logos, Jesus was already the lamb slain from the creation of the world. So since God calls the things which be not as though they already were, uh, God already prophetically in prophetic anticipation, spoke of the child born and son given as if he already was crucified before he was actually born and crucified. I understood, Mr. Ritchie, that it's not even the question. My question was, is Hebrew was 1-3, is it referring to the person Christ? Was not of course, to Hebrews one three. I I would not argue. Hebrews one three is definitely speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the the brightness or radiance of the Father's glory, imprinted as the Son of God. Perfect. Okay, that will conclude my uh my first cross examination period. Now we'll give way to you, Mister Richie. I believe my time is up now. I believe. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, you can you have uh, six minutes to cross exam Mr. William Albridge. Okay. Um, Genesis seventeen seventeen states that Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart. The Hebrew word for heart is lave, which means heart or inner person. And again, Genesis twenty seven forty one, Esau said in his heart, Hebrew word is lave, which means heart or inner person. But in Genesis 8.21, Yahweh smelled a sweet aroma, and Yahweh said in his heart, the, the same Hebrew word, lave, heart or inner person, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Mr. Albrecht, if each of your alleged three distinct God persons were fully omnipresent with each other, how many divine persons were able to anthropomorphically smell a sweet aroma in Genesis 8.21? Was it one person or three divine persons? Omnipresent spirit persons. Genesis, okay, give me that verse again. Genesis what? Genesis eight twenty one. Yahweh smelled a sweet aroma, and Yahweh said in his heart, the Hebrew word for heart here is lave, which means heart or inner person. How many divine persons smelt a sweet aroma in Genesis eight twenty one? And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's part is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything, every, everything living as I have done. Your question is, uh, Jehovah is the term for Lord here, um, Gudios in the Greek. Your question is, is this God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit? Is that your question? Well, that's part of my question. But my question is, how many divine persons... Uh, actually smelt a sweet aroma and said in his heart in Genesis 8.21. Was it one person or three persons? I believe Genesis 8.21 8, is referring to 
God the Father. It, uh, let me see, 8.22, let me go on and read that. While the earth remains, see time. Uh, you know, I would have to do a little bit more research into okay. it, more studying, but I believe it's referring to God the Father. Okay. It uses the interchangeable terms for Kudios and... Uh, okay, so God Hathos, the Father. But, uh, okay, let me, let me go on then. Okay, so if it's one person in Genesis 8.21... Could two alleged omnipresent God persons have temporarily lost their omnipresence by being not able to smell a sweet aroma? Excuse me, could what? Could, in other words, it says in, in Genesis 8.21 that only one divine individual smelt a sweet aroma. Yeah, what Yahweh said I, in his heart, if there's two other I, Yahweh persons, then how could these two other omnipresent God persons have temporarily lost their omnipresence and not have smelled yeah. the sweet aroma. I understand, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, I, I think what you're doing, I think, uh, and, and I don't mean that in an offensive manner whatsoever, I think you're confusing Trinitarianism for tritheism. I think what you're attempting to do is for us to say that uh, every single uh, action done by the Father is the same as every single action done by the Son, that they're all the exact uh, basically same person. That would be completely different from Trinitarianism, and it would not be in line with our Orthodox theology. So, whereas we could say that this verse is referring to God the Father, or perhaps another verse uses Hakuriyas or Hathias in, refer in reference to God the Son. Okay, I, I need you to know. answer the question well, here. I don't want to go off too long because we've got very limited time. Um, can you cite a single verse where God ever spoke of himself as having more than one heart or more than one soul before the Incarnation? You believe there's God, God as three persons, so where is the single verse that, where God says he has more than one heart, more than one soul, anywhere in the Hebrew Scriptures or Greek Scriptures? I don't think I need to look for a verse that says literally that God has more than one heart or more than one soul. I think if we were to look and we were to study the Greek term for pneuma, for spirit, not, not only in reference to Holy Spirit, we look also at the scriptures in the book of Revelation, the book of Corinthians. We compare that with the usage in the book of Genesis, the Spirit. And we can see how that's applied to God the Son in various passages. To okay, well, the, uh, I'm trying to ask specific questions. So the answer is there's no scriptures that you can cite, correct? Um, there's no scripture that says in the exact terminology that you wanted to exist. No, but obviously okay. we take the scripture as a whole. Okay, let me so move on then. One okay. single verse that explains things. Okay, Jesus said in John 14, 24, the word, the logos, Greek text says logos, the logos which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. The original Greek word for word is logos, the same Greek word logos is used in John 1, 1. Hence, the logos that Jesus spoke was not his own logos, but the Father's logos in John, uh, in logos. So in John 1, 1 and in John 1, 14, it states that the word or the logos of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. So, Mr. Albrecht, since Jesus himself declared that his Lagos is the Lagos of the Father, in John 14, 24, and not his own Lagos, how could the Lagos of John 1, 1 not be the Father's Lagos? Yeah, it's not because you're confusing the, you're confusing the Greek term for Lagos here. It's used completely differently in John chapter uh, 14, 24. Uh, the, the usage of this term is completely different. It's used in, no, in a noun nominative masculine singular form, which is similar to its usage in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, which says, For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Completely different usage okay. than uh, the, law, the usage of law okay. in John okay. 1. And let, me, we, let me finish this off with just the last one. Can you submit a single verse to show that the Greek word logos of a human person is either a distinct person beside himself or is his own person? In other words, the Greek word logos. Where can you find a human person called logos? In, in, in the Bible? In the scripture? Yes. In, 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 Attica, in ha logos? Are you speaking about that word? No, the Greek word logos... Uh, anywhere in the Greek New Testament, where does the Greek word logos refer to a human person? A human person? Yes. Um, is the Greek word logos a human person anywhere in the Greek scriptures? Huh. Does logos mean a human person? Well, logos means a person in John 1 1. It depends on its usage, it depends how the Greek is formed. And if we read John 1 1, we can read clearly that it's referring to a person here because it has personal. But, but the, the question Greek. was, 
Uh, the Greek word logos means, I, does not mean a human person in and of itself. So where is a text it, in the Greek New no, Testament? No, oh, definitely not. No, no. Where a human person oh, is called the logos. Yes. No. Yeah, lo logos does not always mean a person. I agree with you on that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I and my father are one it could mean that they are, are one as far as the divine nature uh, but there's definitely still a distinction between the father and the son we know that Jesus Christ is a man so we're not denying the distinction understood. there yeah understood but my question is this I understand that it depends on, on, on uh, basically on the usage similar to um, the usage of the law of the term but I am asking you specifically in John chapter 10 30 where it says I am the father or one I believe it's that I believe I'm quoting it properly if I'm not please correct me does this verse mean because I've heard you say it before does this verse mean that Jesus is the father I do believe it references uh, the oneness of God that that Jesus is one with the father but also can reference a one in union uh, just like we are one as the body of Christ Oh, great. So this verse does not, it doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus is the Father. Am I correct? Not necessarily. Okay, great. I, I don't believe I've ever said that uh, I am my Father one definitely references, you know, only Jesus being the Father. I, I do believe uh, it can reference so that. I, I do believe it does reference right. I think they can have a twofold application. Okay, but the application that you believe is biblical is, is, is that does it mean that Jesus is the Father? You do not think that it strictly means that, then, am I correct? No, because Jesus spoke as a man. He wasn't speaking as God the Father. He was speaking as the Son of God, Son of Man, as a human person. So when he referenced the Father, he normally referenced the Father as his God. And so there, there are times when he said, Before Abraham was, I am, and he that has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, but but yeah. that, that doesn't mean that he walked around all the time saying that he's God because his, he hid his true identity, as a, it says in Isaiah 45, 14, and 15. In the millennial reign, the inhabitants of the earth will say to King Jesus, Surely God is in you, there's none else. There is no other God. Truly you are God who had yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. So God hid his true identity in John 16, 25 by using figurative or veiled I understand. Let me move on. come out and say I'm the Father all the time. Yeah, you answered it perfectly for me. As long as you don't have hold to restrict interpretation of that verse, I'm fine. So I'll move on. Hebrews ten five, Mr. Ritchie. Can you read can you read Hebrews ten five for us? Okay, hold on one second. Hebrews ten five. Not a problem. Uh, where is that? Let me just find my Bible. I have notes on here. Okay, Hebrews ten five. Go can you all right, go ahead. Hebrews. I'll read it in the meantime. Therefore, when he comes in the world. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can, can you read that for us, please? Okay. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, okay. Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Okay. Mr. Ritchie. Is this verse literally telling us of when Christ is coming into the world? Uh, yes, it is a prophecy out of Psalm, uh, I believe Psalm 45. Okay. Um, it tells us, you prepared a body for me, am I correct? Yes. Mr. Ritchie, is this before the Incarnation? Uh, yes, of course the body was prepared before the Incarnation. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, who prepared the body? God the Father. Okay. So, let me follow this logic. Is this the Son making a clear reference to the Father? Basically, existing as a person pre-incarnation with the Father? Well, of course, uh, the scripture says that 
in him, in Christ, we were chosen before the world was even created. And in 1 Peter 1.20, it says he was foreknown before the creation of the world. So in God's prophetic logos, in God's expressed thought, he was already uh, crucified. In Psalm, Psalm 22, 1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As if it already happened. So all the messianic okay. prophecies are in prophetic anticipation of the future child born and son given. So in God's sight, the body was already prepared before the incarnation. Okay. That's fantastic that you just said that. The body was prepared before the incarnation. I agree with you. But you're still not answering my question, Mr. Richie. My question is this. Oh, um, is this not clearly showing that Christ existed with the Father as a separate, distinguishable person before the Incarnation in Hebrews 10.5. Okay, to answer your question, I just quoted the whole verse in context, and at the very end, in verse 7, it ends with, uh, I said, Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Well, a pre-incarnate heavenly co-equal God the Son person would have not would not have said I have come to do your will O God if that co-equal God person was already fully God in the first place he wouldn't say I have come to do your will O God this is the post incarnational man Christ Jesus who spoke these words in fulfillment of this prophecy when he was on the earth out of Psalm okay. 40 verses Richie. 6 through 7 it's a prophecy from Psalm 46 and 7 Mr. Ritchie the Greek reads D.R. Ice hair coming off which says coming into the world. When he's coming into the world, there's a body that's already been prepared for him. Am I correct? Well, again, it's a direct quote from Psalm 46 and 7. So yes. this was God speaking in advance. Five, God spoke, so. called the things which be not, Romans 4, 17, as though they already were. So the body was prepared before the creation of the world, just as Jesus was foreknown before the creation of the world, 1 Peter 1, 20. So the body was prepared pre-incarnation. Yes, in God's logos, right. in God's expressed thought, because the whole world was already pre-created in Christ before the world okay, actually so was created I, in God's predestined well, plan. As they thought then, is that what you're saying? Pre-incarnation, this verse is referring to Christ as having existed as a thought in God the Father, is that correct? Yes, because the body of Christ, the physical body of Jesus, was born at Bethlehem. Jesus didn't have a pre-incarnate body before the incarnation. Okay, that's that. My, my cross-examination time is up. And all it goes so fast. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. It goes so fast. I wish we had so much. So we have uh, now a seven-minute cross-exam of Stephen Ritchie um, cross-examining William Alpert, and we can begin that now. Okay. Whenever the one true God of the Bible is described anthropomorphically, he always uh, the scriptures always speak of him as a single individual God, just like a single individual human breed, uh, being. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this. We read of the face of God, Exodus 33, 20. We read of the mouth of God, Numbers 12, 8. The breath of God, Psalm 80, uh, 33, 6. The eyes of God, Genesis 6, 8. And so forth. Mr. Albrecht, can you submit a single verse of scripture where the one true God is ever anthropomorphically, with human attributes, spoken of as more than one divine scripture? Or, I'm sorry, more than one divine person in the Bible. Can you submit a single verse of Scripture where the one true God anthropomorphically is spoken of as more than one divine person? Where is a single verse yeah. of Scripture where the one true God has more than one face, mouth, nose, arm, and so forth? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really, really good question. Because although I don't quite grasp the, 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 the heart of your question, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, the Greek for part several times is used is actually brachiona. It depends what part is being referred to. Sometimes it's referring to a literal part, sometimes like a leg, an arm, as you mentioned before, sometimes a, a heart. Uh, it depends. The usage many times is prophetic, such as the Sirach 36 5, we read. Then they will know, as we have known, that there is no God but you, O Lord. Then it says, Give me a sign and work other words. Make your hand and right arm glorious. So we find a number of instances in the Septuagint. Uh, I'm not exactly certain exactly where in the New Testament, but the Septuagint Greek, where two parts are used to signify powerful signs of the Lord. So whenever you hear, um, for instance, that term, arm of the Lord, or heart, che even chest is used, a lot of times it's used in a, you know, sometimes a symbolic manner to reference, uh, I guess, sometimes the agency of their strength. Basically, um, it really depends on the usage. Okay, Mr. Albert, where is a single verse, though? A verse of scripture where the one true God has more than one face, 
mouth, nose, arm, and so forth. Can you just cite a single verse to show the plurality of yeah. persons in the Godhead anthropomorphically? Yeah. Uh, again, again, you are you are basically creating no, no offense, to Mr. Ritchie, but a monster out of God. The, the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. Christians do not view the Trinity as a three-headed beast. Basically, that is not how we view the Trinity. We don't okay. view God as having three heads, uh, uh, three hearts. Basically, uh, a beast out of the Book of Revelation. So, for, for me to find a single scripture that explains that would basically define tritheism would be impossible because I don't believe that tritheism is biblical. And I think you're really confusing the doctrine of the Trinity for an early church heresy. These questions are, they, they don't make much sense in terms of Trinitarian theology. Well, uh, Trinitarian theology does not does not say that Trinitarian theology is three co-equal, co-eternal, distinct persons. You would think somewhere uh, in exactly. Scripture you'd find three three anthropomorphically uh, three anthropomorphical faces or persons somewhere, but there is not apparently. Well, let me, let, your... let me ask that question. That's exactly that is exactly why we're not going to find a verse that speaks of a deity walking around with three different heads, three different hearts. And, and bunches and bunches of different body parts. Just illogical. We okay. see terms that refer to Christ as the one true God, the Holy Spirit as the one true God, and the Father is the one true God. That is Orthodox Trinitarian theology. Orthodox Trinitarian theology is not viewing an individual with three different heads, basically something out of the Book of Revelation. Okay, so, so the answer is there's, there's no verse, but do you still believe that? The answer is that tritheism is not biblical, therefore okay. I reject it, and I'm a Trinitarian. Okay, that is historical. okay, Psalm 110 one states, Yahweh said to my Lord, Adon, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Mr. Albrecht, how could God the Father have said to a completely uh, co-equal, pre-incarnate, God the Son person, sit at my right hand, if the alleged co-equal <laughs> God the Son person was already at the Father's right hand in the first place? Okay, you're referring to Psalm 110? Yes. Psalm, of David, where says, Psalm 110 1 Lord. says that Yahweh, the Hebrew tetragrammaton is there, said to my Lord, the Lord Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. How could God the Father have said to a completely co-equal pre-incarnate God the Son, sit at my right hand, if the alleged co-equal God the Son person was already co-equally at the Father's right hand to begin with? Yeah, Psalm 110 is a, uh, basically a prophetic psalm. Uh, this verse, in the literal rendering of it, is not even referring to, uh, and when it says the Lord, that is referring to God. It says actually Hawkwudiyoth, and then it's actually referring to a different type of Lord in 109. And then if you refer to this in a prophetic sense, we can see in the book of Revelation that the throne is actually not just the Father's throne. We can see that the throne is shared by the God the Father and God the Son. Therefore, the term, the term latria is used for both. And we can see that they are both, actually the, the verse right before this harkens to this verse, uses the exact same Greek term. We can see that the term latria, which is exclusive for worship, is being used to be given to God the Father. And then we see the Lamb, which is God the Son. The two equal, two, two, receive that equal terminology which, which is exclusive exclusively used for deity and it's being shown as being used okay i don't want to get up the topic too far here okay so let me go on to the next question uh why is it that we never see an alleged pre-incarnate heavenly god the son person coically beside the heavenly father prior to the incarnation can you submit a single verse of scripture where an alleged pre-incarnate heavenly son was seated next to the heavenly father before the incarnation we don't need to see a verse where it says that he's seated next to the Father pre-incarnation because we can see all throughout the scripture, a number of verses, we can see that the Son existed as a person with the Father pre-incarnation. That is all over the scriptures. I, I Where is the verse? Well, for a number of scriptures that show that. Hebrews 1, 3, hearkening to Wisdom 7, 20, it shows the eternal generation of the Son. If we go to uh, Hebrews 10, 5, the same thing, the body prepared for me, uh, that's pre-incarnation shows two people, two people that share equal glory that existed pre-incarnation. Okay, so where is the uh, verse that says the Father and Son were dialoguing with each other before the Incarnation? <laughs> we don't have to have a verse that says that they are dialoguing. We can see that the mission and the point of the, uh, 
of, of basically Trinitarian theology is there. We don't need to have a verse that has them having a conversation. Okay. Wow, that's seven minutes goes by fast. It goes by so fast. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Um, so this is the last set of cross exams, and um, and then we'll have the closing remarks, and then we'll open up the line. So, um, William, you cross exam Stephen Ritchie, and then Stephen Ritchie will have the last cross exam. Okay, I'm gonna try and cram as much as I can here, Mr. Ritchie. Excuse me, can you turn to John 17, verse 3? Okay. Can you read that for us, please? Up to, up to verse 5, please. <coughs> okay. Jesus', Jesus prayer, he said to the Father, uh, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself for the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay, Mr. Ritchie, in verse 3, the only true God in Jesus Christ, are these two persons being referred to? Yes, there's, there's only one true God. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's only one God, the Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Understood, understood. Clarify, John chapter 17, verse 3, is referring to two persons. My next question to you is this. The passage that says, the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed, is this speaking of the pre-incarnation? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, God pre-planned and pre-arranged all things before the incarnation. This is the predestined okay. plan of God. Great. So what you just said, Mr. Ritchie, let me, let me make sure I'm not twisting your words. You just said that verse 3 is speaking of two persons, and this is speaking of the glory, which is pre-incarnation. Am I correct? Well, of course, Jesus had pre-incarnational glory, just as God's elect had pre-incarnational glory in Romans 8, 29, 30. It says that those who God foreknew, his elect, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, and those whom he called, he also glorified. So if God's elect can be Great. glorified in God's predestined plan, how much more the son of God? Great. So we're speaking about uh, John 17, 3 right now. Okay, um, I'm right glad there. that you're still with, with the scriptures. Well, right now we're in John 17, 3, and we're on the same mindset that this is speaking of two persons. You said that. Am I correct? I just want to clarify that. Well, yes, there's only one true God who is the Spirit of the Father, and there's one Lord Jesus Christ, one God and one man. Okay. But that man Great. did not always eternally exist as God the Son of Man. Wait, Mr. Richie, you just told me that the glory is speaking of that is speaking of here is pre incarnation. Are you now telling me that what it says, the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed, is this not pre incarnation? Uh, no, I'm, yeah, I'm saying there's pre-incarnational glory. Let me just explain. Uh, the passage starts out in John 17, 1. Jesus prayed, saying, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Jesus asked for glory because a specific hour or time had come in which he would be glorified. An alleged omnipresent God the Son person would not need to ask for glory because the unchangeable true God can never be without his glory. I am Yahweh, I change not. So the glory in John 17, 5 that Jesus had, past tense, was, God, was his predestined glory as the Son of God. Because when Jesus was praying, he was not speaking as God. He was speaking as a man. In fact, Jesus I mean, never identified no, himself as no, God. Just one second. Yeah, Jesus no. never identified himself as God when he prayed. He always prayed, he always prayed as a man. But when he referenced himself as God in John 8, 58, he said, before Abraham was, I am. He spoke to the Pharisees. John 14, 9, he spoke to his disciples. Mr. Richard, when the verse says, Father, is this speaking of God the Father? Just a yes or a no. When the yes. verse begins saying, Father, is this speaking of God the Father? Yes, there's only one true God, the Father, one man. Okay, yes. Where it says, glorify me. Who is the me referring to? The Son of God, the Son of Man, the one who was born at Bethlehem. Okay, as you said earlier, this, these were two persons. Let me ask you again to clarify. Is this verse, which has God the Father and God the Son, we both agree with that, is this verse showing two distinguishable persons uh, I don't both believe, having divine glory? I don't believe in a God the Son. Uh, I believe the, the God the Father okay. is always used throughout the, the New Testament. We never find God the Son. This is one God 
and one man jesus was praying as a man he was not speaking as god in in john 17 let me let me rephrase that for you so this verse has god the father and the son as two distinguishable persons both having divine glory pre-incarnation am i correct well jesus did not actually experience that glory in john 17 1 through 5 jesus had predestined glory just as god's elect had predestined glory in romans 8 29 30. jesus was foreknown oh, oh. before the creation of the world before the creation of the world holds the same essential meaning in 1 peter 1 20 as before the world was in john 17 5. just as revelation 13 8 says the lamb was already slain before the creation of the world so in god's predestined plan he had glory he was praying hold on one second he was praying for that glory because a specific hour or time had come in which he would be glorified so a heavenly god the son let me i didn't I'll let you speak a heavenly god the son person would not need to pray for glory because he should have said he already had glory he already had uh, glory present you have to answer the question or you have to allow um, your cross examiner to cross okay and i'm explaining the passage here you're trying to narrow it down you gotta look at the whole context no no that's you're answering another question. That's not my question, Mr. Ritchie. Go ahead. Time is going up real fast. That has nothing to do with what I'm asking. I'm not even talking about prayer. I, my question is this. Where it says, So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Are you telling me that the, the Son did not have glory pre-incarnation? Well, I don't know what translation you're using as far as before. in your presence. I have the NASB, which is a very literal translation it says now father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had with you it doesn't say in your presence with you before the world was so the words before the world was holds the same essential meaning as the foreknown glory that the son of god had before the creation of the world in 1 peter 1 20. so what was foreknown the presence of the father in, in, in john 17 3 was he not in the presence of the father before the world existed in a prophetic sense he was in the presence of the father as far as the lamb slain oh, wait, from the creation of the world he okay. god already knew christ just as he knew the prophet jeremiah and jeremiah 1 5 okay. before i formed you in your mother's womb i knew you even though you agree that there are two different persons here now there's only two different persons in a prophetic sense am i correct Yes, and, uh, Jesus Christ was oh. a man born at Bethlehem. That's when he entered, God the Father entered into a new existence as a man. He never was that before. So this is a prophetic that, that, sense that, that, that Jesus that's spoken that's of as having I, glory. Uh, this is God's elect. I'm gonna give, I'll give way to your time now. My, my cross-examination time is up. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, well, we have uh, seven minutes, and then we have uh, closing statements. Wonderful. So you can cross-examine. Uh, Mr. Albert, now, Mr. Richie. Okay, Mr. Albert, you stated in your debate with David Barron, Christ has always had the name Jehovah. However, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 states, I will raise to David a righteous branch and a king shall reign. And this is his name whereby he shall be called Yahweh our righteousness. Notice that the Messiah's name shall be called Yahweh in the future. Okay, so Mr. Albrecht, can you submit a single verse to prove that Christ has always possessed the name of Yahweh or Jehovah before the Incarnation? Mm, yeah, and uh, every single verse that refers to giving Latria to Christ in the, the book of Revelation, um, in uh, the passage that tells us that uh, Christ is our great God and Savior, we know that Christ has always possessed the term Yahweh because he has always been God. But that's a very interesting question because we will see that later on. Um, Mr. Barron asked me, what was the name that, uh, that Christ lacked? And uh, even though in, in a, I guess, in a prophetic type of sense, uh, even though the Father uh, raised his name above the angels, we'll see. Uh, I guess really in a prophetic sense, he really has never lacked any name. But we can see that uh, later on he's attributed with being given the name of Jesus, which would be uh, oh, a name that basically the early church viewed as uh, equivalent with God. So the question, a name, uh, the question a name was, that was raised above the angels, Matthew one twenty one. That was the name that he was given. That he okay. So he was being, given the name, but the question was, can you find a single verse of scripture where Jesus already had the name of Yahweh or Jehovah before the incarnation? That's the question. Well, there is a had, single verse of scripture yeah, that shows Jesus actually possessed the name of Yahweh before the incarnation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Let me go ahead and uh, pop that open for you. Uh, yes, okay. Actually, we know for a fact in John 17, 3, the exact verse that I was referring to, where it says, the only true God, and then it references Jesus Christ. We're, we're showing two different persons here. The verse actually says, okay. I glorify you on earth by finishing the work that you gave you to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence for the glory that I had yep. in your presence before the world existed. So we know for a fact that we've got two different persons here. We see that the glory that I had in your presence okay. before the world existed is speaking of pre-incarnation. Okay, but so that's not answering my question. The answer was, can you cite a single wait, person wait, that a not, verse that shows that Jesus actually had the name Yahweh? You're Okay, that's I'm not done. actually answering the question. The term, I'm not done. I'm answering the question. Go ahead. Yes, I'm not done. Go ahead. The term, I, I wasn't done. The term glory here is very significant because even though you're requesting a passage to say your name was Yahweh, pre-incarnation, we don't need to be put within those parameters, because we can see that this is divine glory here. We can see that he exists in pre-incarnation with the Father, and we can see the terms being applied to him, attributed to him, are terms only attributed to Yahweh God, such as this term used here, and the term Latria. The term Latria in Revelation, you ask for something, proof that he was Yahweh, pre-incarnation, there is no creature or creature that would become a god or what have you, that is given the term Latria, which is exclusive okay. for this. Okay, I have three minutes and 30 seconds, so I want to go on. Um, go ahead. The scripture says in uh, John 17, 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me. And again, we find that in Isaiah 9, 6, his name shall be called the same name as the mighty God and eternal Father. Philippians 2.9 says that God has highly exalted him and gave him the name, which is above all names. Mr. Albrecht, since the son's name was given and obtained, how could the son have always possessed the name that is above every name before the incarnation? Uh, can, you, can you point me to the exact verse? Because I think I know which one you're referring to. I think it's the exact one that Mr. Barron brought up. But could John 17.11? Holy Father, keep uh, them in your name, the name which you have given me. John seventeen eleven. Okay, is, is your question, I guess, is your question similar to Mr. Barron said, perhaps he lacked the name Yahweh? Is that your, is that the Well, my question is, since the son name, son's name was given and obtained, how could the son have always possessed the name of Yahweh that is above every name before the incarnation? Yeah, this, this passage is actually a very significant verse because it's telling us that now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, in, uh, hold on, my, my thing I missed, but Holy Father, keep them, keep them through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. If we go further on in that verse, we can see that this verse is actually um, referring directly to the name that is referred to in Matthew one twenty one, as we can see through all the passages that we've seen. Christ has always had the name Yahweh. He's always been God. He's pre-existed as Hebrews 1, 3 shows us. So this name would be what Matthew one twenty one refers to, a name that he would be given. The exact past tense terms are being referred to here in the same verse, John seventeen eleven. the name that he was given was Jesus. And your, the, the Greek in your doesn't, doesn't literally mean that it is the Father's name, that it is his name. That's not the Greek term that is being used here in John seventeen eleven. So it is consonant with a pointing out that Christ was the name. Okay, I'll, I'll just let the audience sort that one out. Uh, Matthew one twenty one states that the angel commanded Joseph to call their son's name Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, Correct. for he shall save his people from their sins. Can you submit a single verse which says that the name of the Son of God shall be called Son? Did Mary have a son and call his name Son? Son? Why would his name be called Son? Well, Trinitarians baptize saying yeah, Father, I know Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't quite understand that. Well, bat, the yeah, Trinitarians baptize saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so they say that's the three names of the Trinity. Is that not what you believe? The name of the Son is Jesus Christ. He is God. He is God, Jehovah God. We don't need to find anybody calling him by the proper name, Son. I, I've never heard that argument. I don't really understand it. Son. Okay, so his proper name is Son? No, no, actually, I'm arguing the opposite. I don't understand why you would look for him to be called the proper name Son. That is not a Trinitarian belief or argument that his proper name 
It's called Son. Okay, so when you baptize, you baptize saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you find a single verse of Scripture where someone was actually baptized saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rather than uh, in the name of Jesus in the Bible? Yeah, yeah Matthew chapter 28. Yeah, the, the name that is being referred to is Jesus Christ in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It, it's the Son that is being referred to there is Jehovah God, God the Son. It, it, it's not referring to an actual um, person called Son. That is not Trinitarian theology at all. And that is not, and consequently, that is not how, how people are baptized within uh, ancient Christian circles. Or even in Protestant circles, for that matter. They're not baptized by saying, you're baptized in the, you know, in the name of the Father and Son in the term of a proper name. That, you know, okay, I think I'm out of time here. Right. Is there any more time? I think we're out of time. I, I, yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The time goes by like so, so fast. Yeah. Well, we have um, two sets of closing statements to look forward to, and um, then we'll take uh, questions from um, those that have been listening. And um, if you have been listening, just to prepare yourself, uh, if you're listening by PC, the number is 347-934-0379, and then just press 1 so that we will be able to see you in the switchboard. But we're going to have two closings. So the next 16 minutes belong to these two gentlemen. Uh, thank them both for the, for the debate that we currently had, and we look forward to a uh, reprisal in June. So uh, the first closing statement will be by uh, Mr. Albridge, and then Steve yeah. and Richie has the final, uh, final say. Okay, I want to start my closing off by thanking Stephen for being here for today's debate. I, I want to first say off that, say off the bat that um, I, I am very impressed that Stephen, that I can tell in Stephen, in Mr. Ritchie's voice and, and in his knowledge of the scripture passages by memory, that he has a deep, a deep understanding and love for God. You know, he loves God, he loves the scriptures, and I hope people get that from these debates, that we love God, we love the word of God, and we're here debating in a, in a, in a manner as brothers. I consider Stephen Ritchie to be a, a, a good friend of mine. I've, I've become, gotten to know him a little bit better since we arranged these debates. And I think he's a very intelligent man. I think he's, he's a, he loves God. And I think he's very sincere. And, and I, I, it, it pains me to say that I don't think he has a clue uh, as to what Trinitarian theology really is. I think he's got an idea here and there, but I, I think he's very astute when it comes to his own modalist, modalism theology. But Trinitarian theology... I don't think he quite understood a number of our positions. But again, I, I would urge anybody to rewind, listen to John chapter 17, verse 3, because Mr. Ritchie admitted what we've been saying from the very beginning. There are two persons here. Before Mr. Ritchie got defensive and understood where we were going, he admitted there are two persons here. In John 17, 3, God the Father, Jesus Christ, God the Son. Speaking of glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Divine glory, okay? Is this speaking about pre-incarnation? Has to be. It has to be. Because the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed is pre-incarnation. So this verse has God the Father and God the Son as two distinguishable persons, both having divine glory, pre-incarnation. Mr. Ritchie brought up church fathers in his opening. Too bad we weren't able to get into them. But I was able to compile around 42 early patristic references some by the same individual multiple times, making commentary on these verses. And not a one of these ancient sources, not a one, would interpret this verse any differently than the Trinitarian manner of interpreting it. Not a one. Not a one. We, got, we went into Hebrews 1.3, Mr. Ritchie didn't quite understand why I went into that. I'll tell you why. This Greek word, apaldasma, used here is very significant. Very significant because he is the reigning from glory. Mr. Ritchie admitted it. I didn't, I did not put in the words in his mouth, but why didn't listen? He admitted the radiance of the glory is Christ. Good. Because Hebrews 1.3 is referring to a person. This person is being given the attributes of a person that pre-existed, that was divine, divine as Almighty God divine, in that sense. 
Read any word you want in Wisdom 726. Don't let something be put over your eyes and be diverted to another verse. Read Wisdom 726. Look at that Greek word, apogasma. I want you to do me another favor. An even greater interest is the usage of this passage and the linking ancient manuscripts. Look this up. Look how the early patristic sources universally connected this verse with Hebrews. Look it up. Look up the analysis of these passages in the Gettingen Septuagint. There are pa- what is the Gettingen Septuagint? It is the most massive, best, most ancient source collection of Septuagint documents you're going to find on the planet. Read the analysis by the Coptic scholars. Read how this verse is referring to a pre-existent person. A person that pre-existed. The author of the book of Hebrews is connecting these verses for a very significant reason. Very significant reason. The generation of the Son is eternal and also continuous. The Father is beginning the Son at each instant. Just as light is always emitting its radiance. By eternity and continuity, the Father can express eternity conceived as a unique instant which cannot be expressed by human language. The Son is begotten by the Father, as the reflection is by the light, as the will proceeds from the intellect, or as the word is emitted by the intellect. The Father applies this to the generation. The title given to wisdom in the Book of Wisdom, a breath of the power of God, a very pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. And what is, what is, what is the author of the Book of Hebrews? He applies this to a person. How shocking is that? A person. But what does this person exist? Well, it's referring to an eternal person. This person existed pre-incarnation. It doesn't get any easier than that. You don't have to connect the dots in any other manner than that. It's really, really easy. We can see that he has always existed as, as, as God, God the Son. We were asked what name, and I, I, I was asked the same question by Mr. Barron, and uh, during the, the poll, calls from the audience, I was baffled with baffled that Mr. Barron would use this argument because it's a betrayal with anything that the Greek says. The Father is not saying, no, I gave you this name Yahweh right now, and, you know, I've just bestowed it upon you. Not at all. That is a twisting of what the Greek is saying. What name, if you want to say that Christ blocked the name, what name did he lack? What name was he given? He was given the name Jesus, which was raised, which was raised up. That's the name Yahweh, because that's what he can he has always been God Almighty. Christ came into the world, Hebrews 10, 5. But a body you have prepared for me. Literally, you need to read the Greek. Via Eich Er And I'm anglicizing that because if I were to pronounce it the proper way, it would sound weird. I'm anglicizing it. It'll be easy to look up. So which coming it reads, then it tells us you prepare a body for me. Before the incarnation, it has to be, right? I mean, it's coming into the world, and a body you have prepared for me. Well, who prepared the body? Mr. Richie admitted it who did it. It was the Father. He wants the reference of these two being two distinguishable persons pre incarnation all over the Bible. This is the Son making clear reference to the Father. Want more clear references? I bet you anything, you're not going to get any point of revelation with the Greek term lapidia. Look out for it. Because I'd be shocked if Mr. Ritchie mentions that in a relevant manner. Lapidia is given to two persons. There's no way you can twist the Greek. There is zero way, and every ancient manuscript has the same way. Lapidia is given to two persons. God the Father and the Lamb. God the Son. Where we have the terms in the Greek showing two distinct, distinguishable persons. Can Mr. Ritchie say, oh, well, the manifestation is given Lathria? You're not going to find anywhere, anywhere in the, in the Greek Old Testament or in the Greek New Testament where the Greek term Latria, anglicizing it now, the Greek term Latria is used for a creature or a manifestation. It is only used for God Almighty, and how shocking, Revelation has it used for God the Son and God the Father as two distinguishable persons. Isn't that shocking? It shouldn't be shocking. Because the doctrine of the Trinity is biblical, and it is historical, and the doctrine of modalism is not just against the Scriptures, not just 
against anything the Bible says. It is not historical. There are no bishops that believe in this doctrine. That, that's silliness. There's no early bishops that believe this. There's no early church fathers that believe this. This was condemned by the early church. This was condemned by the early church. And it is not a biblical doctrine. And my time is winding up. And I will close this off by saying thank you, God, for being a great moderator. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie, for being an incredible debater and a person that I I like to... I, I'm glad that I can call my friend. That will conclude my closing. That will give way to Mr. Ritchie now. And thank you so much. So um, we have now Stephen Ritchie, and he will have his last eight-minute closing statement. And then we'll open up the lines. And you can begin now, Mr. Ritchie. Okay, thank you, William, for your kind words. Uh, Mr. Albrecht, I really appreciate it. Um, Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the radiance of his, the Father's glory, and the exact representation as the imprint of of the hypostasis, the nature of the Father as a human being, because it has to reference Jesus as a human being, because God the Father could not have eternally imprinted his nature on another divine person. That doesn't make sense. For someone to be a copy of someone else, there had to be a time when he was copied. It's in the same sense that Hebrews 1.5 cites uh, 2 Samuel 7, 14, that God the Father said, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. It makes no, no sense for an eternal God the Son of Man to be existing in the heavens before the incarnation. It makes no sense, because I asked Mr. Albrecht to give me a reason why the Son is called the Son, other than the New Testament reason given in Luke one thirty five. It, it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon the virgin, and for this reason you shall call his uh, call him the Son of God. For what reason? Because the Holy Spirit performed the act of the Incarnation. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 says, When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Uh, my opponent stated that the angels of God were worshiping the Son before the Incarnation, but I don't find a single verse in Scripture. Only when the Son of God was born of a woman, that's when all the angels of God worshipped the Son. The modalistic monarchian theology, which I can prove in my next debate, was held by the majority of believers in the late 2nd century and to the early 3rd century. Uh, they believed that there's only one God, and that one God is the Father, a single monarch. And he modally existed or manifested himself as his own word and as his own Holy Spirit incarnating himself in the Virgin. That's why I said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He didn't say, he that has seen me has seen the Eternal Son. The scriptural evidence proves that the he who was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, and the he who partook of flesh and blood in Hebrews 2.14, is the Holy Spirit of the only true God, the Father. The Holy Spirit is not a third person. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father in emanation. Genesis 1.2 says the Holy Spirit acted, and then God spoke. And he said, let there be light and dry land and so forth. So God the Father created all things alone and by himself through his own hands. Uh, the scripture says in Psalm 8, 5, and 6 that he has appointed the Son to rule over the works of his hands, the Father's hands. So the Son did not create anything as the Son because the Son is the man who was born at Bethlehem. But Jesus wasn't just a man. He's called Emmanuel, God with us. God becoming a man. Yahweh becoming our salvation. Psalm 18, 14. And so I asked Mr. Albrecht some questions. I asked him to cite a single verse where God ever spoke of himself as having more than one heart, more than one soul before the Incarnation. Uh, he took up time, but I do not see a meaningful response because there was not a single verse of Scripture that he could answer my question with. Yet he believes that God is three persons. I asked him to submit a single verse to show that the Greek word logos uh, it can be used of a human person as a person in and of itself. He could not submit a single verse because the Greek word logos means the expressed thought of a human individual or plural individuals. So the Logos in John 1.1 1, 1 does not have to be a pre-incarnate God the Son. The Logos of God is God's expressed thoughts coming from his own mind. Proverbs 2.6 says that Yahweh gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And so I asked Mr. Albrecht to submit a single verse of scripture where the one true God is ever 
anthropomorphically spoken of as having more than one uh, mouth, one more than one face, nose, arm, and so forth. He can't give any because there are none. It would make sense if God is really three persons. We should find this uh, mysterious God the Son and God the Holy Spirit in the Hebrew Scriptures. We only find a father and son relationship after the incarnation, after the child was born, after the son was given. 1, two, uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there are, are two persons. There's only one divine individual called the only true God the Father and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. In John 17.5, Jesus spoke of his predestined glory. Uh, the context of John 17.5 proves that he said, the glory which I had past tense with you, not the glory that I have with you. If he was speaking out of his deity and his alleged God the Son, he should have said, the glory which I have with you currently, just as he said before Abraham was, I am in John 8, 58. So whenever Jesus prayed, he was praying out of his human consciousness, just like when he was tempted of the devil, he was being tempted as a genuine man. So it was the man Christ Jesus who had predestined glory, just as the lamb was already slain from the creation of the world. He was already the firstborn in the mind and plan of God, Colossians 1.15, and he already had, in God's mind, had an image in God's prophetic logos, and that invisible image became flesh in John 1.14, and that's when the child-born son given was called the he, who was to be worshipped by all the angels. I cited 1 Peter 1.20, which states that God the Father was, uh, that God the Father said to his foreknown son, um, that he was foreknown before the creation of the world. So in God's expressed thought, uh, Jesus was foreknown before the world was even created, just as God's elect were foreknown in Romans 8, 29 and 30. I had asked Mr. Albert to, uh, in his debate with David Barron, uh, Christ has, has always had the name Jehovah. That's what he said. Mr. Albert said that. And so in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, it states, I will raise to David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. In other words, an eternal God the Son was not called Yahweh, but he would be called Yahweh in the future. I asked Mr. Albert, can you submit a single verse to prove that Christ has always possessed the name of Yahweh before the Incarnation? He could not submit a single verse. He quoted John 17, 5 to assume that he had the name, but he could not find a verse to prove it. Uh, and during my opening statements, I had said uh, that an alleged pre-incarnate heavenly God, the Son person, entered the Virgin to perform the incarnation. I, I asked Mr. Uh, Albert this question. I had said, Mr. Albert, can you cite a single verse to show that an alleged pre-incarnate heavenly God, the Son person, entered the Virgin to perform the incarnation? He had no response. I asked him to give us a reason why the Son was called the Son other than the New Testament reason given in Luke 135. He had no response. There was no verse. He could not cite a verse. I quoted Colossians 2.9, which informs us that all the fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus in bodily form. I said all means all. That means Jesus had to have been the incarnation of the only true God, the Father. I cited John 14.10, which says, The Father who dwells in me, he does the works. So it was the Father who was in the Son, reconciling the world to himself, not an alleged heavenly God, the Son. Uh, I asked Mr. Albert why the New Testament scriptures teach that there's only one true God, the Father, and only one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. I opened with John 17, 3, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, explaining there's only one individual called the only true God, the Father, and one man. We never heard a meaningful response from Mr. Albert against this. So the titles God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are absent from the Greek text of scripture. Yet my opponent believes in an eternal God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. I presented 1 Peter 1.20, For he, Jesus, was foreknown before the creation of the world. Thayer's Greek's lexicon and Strong's concordance states that prognosco means to have known or knowledge of beforehand. I asked, how could Jesus have literally existed as a son before being foreknown? For to foreknow about somebody means that he did not literally exist before being foreknown. Am I up? I think I'm done. God bless you. I've enjoyed this debate. I love the Word of God, and, and I, I love my opponent, and I do look forward to spending time and, uh, and being friends. God bless. Okay, thank you so much. It was a very good debate, cordial debate. Um, I believe it's the first of its kind, so I believe it's a, a historic debate um, to have a one that's been a council and a Roman Catholic debating on this subject. And looking forward to uh, 
another debate, let our listening audience know that um, they will have another debate on June 20th, and this will be dealing with the early church's teaching, the historic uh, ramifications of the oneness versus Trinity debate. So um, that's going to be very interesting in and of itself. Just want to let everyone know if you want to ask any questions of either of these gentlemen on today's debate, the number is 347-934-0379 and just press 1 and uh, we can see you as a caller in queue and then you can go ahead and ask your questions. If not, and then until that time comes, um, I'll have my own set of questions that I will be asking <laughs> these gentlemen. Um, sometimes our listeners are a little shy, and sometimes they like to come late to the party um, <laughs> when the music's already on and everybody's yeah. dancing. So <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they press one right at the last 10 seconds. Yeah, so, um, so you know... Uh, you know, don't be late to the party, you guys. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, we have a little bit of an extended period of time. And um, and so um, uh, also just want to remind our listeners um, of my dear friend, uh, Tanya Locklear. Um, and uh, she's battling cancer, and she has six tumors in her brain and three other tumors in other parts of her body. And so if you can help this family, just go to GoFundMe.com backslash GoTanya and help support this family and, and uh, give them a, a little bit of breathing room in their finances and what they're having to deal with, um, you know, with a young mother and, and, and wife. And uh, so... Uh, try to go ahead and help them out. Did any little doma donation, I'm sure, will be helpful. Um, other than that, um, I don't see anybody pressing one right now. And um, and people have been in and out of this debate throughout the debate. I, I saw people popping in and popping out. But uh, if you, uh, I see some people popping in right now. Um, if you have any questions, just press one. If you're listening to the program and you want to ask a question from Stephen Ritchie, who's a oneness Pentecostal and holds the modalist position, and we also have William Albrecht, who's a Catholic and holds the Trinitarian position, we have somebody. Okay, so let me just go ahead and put them on the air. Hello? Uh, there you go. 830, you're on the air. Hi, I just have a question for William. Uh, uh -huh. Mr. William, how does Hebrews 1-3 mean Christ was eternal? Does this, does uh, wisdom say this? Oh, that's a good question. Um, excuse me. Um, that goes back to what I brought up in my opening statement. And um, that's a really good question. I guess the, the best way to answer that is that um, uh, wisdom does not use the word Christ. Uh, it is a, a basically a, a prophecy. Hebrews 1.3 is referring to Christ, though. So this verse is actually very, very significant because as Mr. Ritchie uh, and myself both agree, when it says he is the radiance and glory, it is referring to Christ. And the author of the book of Hebrews is hearkening to the book of wisdom. And it's very significant because it is, it is connecting Christ as being eternal with the eternal light of the book of wisdom. And I know that uh, some people would... Um, uh, I guess, uh, argue and say, well, look, that's referring to life. So it can't be referring to Christ, but that's the thing. <clears throat> uh, the book of wisdom, the, the book of Hebrews is referring to a person in Christ. The Greek is clear with that. And it is hearkening to the apologosma, to the refulgence of glory of the book of wisdom. So this is clear in showing that, uh, in my theology, I would argue that it shows that the Son has always been Yahweh. Of course, there's a lot of other uh, passages that can be used, but I find this passage particularly because amongst the early church and the, the arguments and dialogues with, with the Jews and other groups that did not believe, particularly the Gnostics as well, um, did not believe Christ was deity, this passage was a classic passage that was used by the early church, which was uh, wisdom. I, I kind of went wrong on that, but I, that does get to the heart of your question. If I may interject, uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty four uh, refers to Jesus. It says, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power.
power of God and the wisdom of God. And um, I think if if we were to read the patristics, it would reveal that they uh, that verse they believed alluded to Christ's wisdom, not only in the um, in the Book of Wisdom, but also in Proverbs chapter eight, specifically. Where it refers to wisdom as a co-creator, yes, um, Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians use John uh, Proverbs eight as an attempt to say that Jesus was created um, because it speaks of wisdom as being produced quena or kena um, or possessed, which is what most translations try to use there of Proverbs eight twenty four. Uh, my rebuttal has always been verse 32, which always which says that wisdom is from everlasting Ha'olam. Yes. And yes. Um, Ha'olam and, and is used of uh, yes. uh, wisdom, uh, uh, wisdom there, and it's used also in, I think, prophetically of Christ in Malachi 3.1, and also used of God's throne in Can I get a um, uh I think from everlasting to everlasting. So, uh, speaking yeah, and, of the And I brought that passage up specifically because I, I didn't, um, I, I've been speaking with Mr. Ritchie, uh, you know, on and off, and uh, I think we're both of the same accord that Mr. Ritchie does believe that uh, wisdom is a um, is scriptural. Am I, am I correct that you still believe that, Mr. Ritchie? That wisdom is, is what? I believe it's a breath sure. of the power of God, a pure emanation of the no, glory no, no. of the Almighty. I mean, the Oh, is it scripture? Is it scripture? Uh, well, that's debatable, but I definitely venerate it because it's part of the Septuagint, and it was read by many of the early church fathers. I would like to point out, though, that Sirach 1.4 states that wisdom was created before all other things. So, uh, wisdom in and of itself is not a divine, co-equal God, the Son person. It's a breath of the power of God, a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty, according to Wisdom 7.1. Where does it say that wisdom was created before all other things? Yes, that's what it says. So we're not speaking literally what was scripture? here. What's that, sir? What scripture was that? You oh, that's in Sirach 1.4. And again, Sirach 24.9 says, Before the ages in the beginning, he created me. So if wisdom is a divine person in and of itself, then that divine person was created. You'd have Arianism and not Trinitarianism. This is metaphorical yeah. language. This is not literal. Jesus, um, Solomon was more literal when he said in Proverbs 2, 6, Yahweh gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So wisdom comes from the mouth of God as an emanation of God. It's not another divine person. That's the same meaning of the Greek word logos in John 1, 1. It's an emanation from the mouth of God the Father, God's own expressed thoughts before the world was created. Well, I think Mr. Rick is making a really good point in that he, 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 and, I, and I agree with him there's a debate in reference to uh, one comment he made on on, <clears throat> on the word logos. It, 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 it's important uh, uh, terminology, the way it is used in the Greek, and um, basically uh, basically what it's referring to and the context are very, very important. I would agree with him. I did agree that logos is, is not always used in, in the sense that I mentioned it. I I didn't even bring up logos, but I, I agree that it's not always used in, um, I don't think Trinitarians argue in a, in a person type of sense, but uh, he's also correct with Sirach 1-4 uh, in the sense of uh, this verse being used for wisdom. He's correct in regards to that. Um, there are a number of passages uh, wisdom is referred to in many different matters. But again, it, it, it all depends how the scriptures are being are using it, and Hebrews 1-3 right. hearkens to wisdom in that certain manner, not in the certain manner from Sirach 1-4. It's a completely different manner. So the, the context is very important, and in that sense, I do agree with Mr. Ritchie. Context is everything. I, I, I do have a question for Mr. Ritchie, um, and, if, and just let me throw this number out again before before I go ahead and give my question, because then I might not, might not get it in. The number is 347-934-0379, press 1. If you have a question for Mr. Ritchie or for, uh, for Ms. Albridge, uh, those of you who are listening by PC or, um, or by phone. Um, uh, I, I think you mentioned um, the issue about logos, that is the word, uh, never being used uh, to describe a person. Um, but wouldn't you agree that in John chapter 
one because it says that the word became flesh that here it is no doubt describing that God's word which of course is John 1 1 we're, we're describing God's word his, his pre-existent word um, that was there in the beginning has now become a human being by right? its statement that the word became flesh so no doubt the word here or the logos is being described as uh, now having personification because it has become flesh I mean what what is becoming flesh if it's not the word and, and whose flesh is it becoming right well I agree uh, that there are two persons you cannot deny the distinction between the father and the son Jesus Christ according to Hebrews 2 17 was made exactly like his brethren, fully human in every way. It's in that sense that Jesus had to have prayed and had to have been tempted or else he would not have been a fully human person. But my argument is against the pre-incarnate heavenly God the Son person because there is no scriptural evidence to prove that. Jesus pre-existed the incarnation as the eternal word and as the Holy Spirit of the Father. But he did not exist as a a concrete, definitive, divine, co-equal person before the Incarnation. He existed in the mind and plan of God as the Lamb slain before the creation of the world, as the firstborn to rule over all creation, Colossians 1, 15, and we compare that with Psalm 8, 5, and 6, that Jesus is the Son who was appointed to rule over the works of God the Father's hands. Therefore the Father created all things alone and by himself. Malachi 2.10 says, Have we not one Father? Has not one God created us? But Jesus became a human person. The child born and the son was given, but that child born and son given, he was given the name that's above all names. That's why Isaiah 9.6 says that he received the name of of his father, he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the angels in Hebrews 1 4. So that's why Isaiah 9 6 calls the name of Jesus the name of the eternal father, the name of the mighty God, because he has the father's name, because he is the full incarnation of that only true God, the Father who came to save us from our sins. Um, yeah, and I would ask, um, what's your position on um, Old Testament? Uh, angelic appearances where, for example, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, in the Old Testament and several appearances, one, for example, uh, when the angel of Yahweh appears to Manoah, or the angel of Yahweh appears to, um, as it was it, uh, when he wrestled Jacob, this angel claims to have a an affable name within him that they cannot comprehend. Um, uh, I think to Manoah he, said, he says that they can't comprehend this name that he has within him. Um, most Trinitarians, and if you read just a martyr, martyr is probably the father of Old Testament theophany or Christophany theology. Um, most Trinitarians uh, assert that these and angelic appearances, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, is the pre-incarnate Christ uh, with that divine name within him okay. uh, appearing in several instances, you know, uh, uh, to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre in Genesis 28. Um, uh, uh, the Lord uh, rained down upon Sodom from the Lord of Heaven, uh, Amos 4.11, and also that's also, I think, found in Genesis 28, repeated there uh, later on. Um, so how do uh, uh, modalists interpret these uh, appearances that uh, they don't believe these are pre-incarnate um, uh, appearances of Jesus Christ? Well, one does Pentecostals vary in their interpretation. Um, I take the position that Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 states that God spoke in time past to the Israelite ancestors by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So the text does not say that God spoke in the Old Testament time or the the pre to Old Testament time to the patriarchs by the Son, it says that the Son has not spoken until these last days. Therefore, the angelic appearances uh, was God 
revealing himself through angels, through the law of agency. And I have the Jewish literature here I could quote. I don't want to take too much time. But, for instance, in the book of Jasher, it's referenced in Joshua 10, 12 through 13, and 2 Samuel 1, 18 through 27. And Jasher 18, 4 says, and this is a very ancient book, says, and the Lord appeared to him, to Abraham, in the plain of Mamre, and sent three of his ministering angels to visit him. There's nothing in the Jewish literature of old to state that these angelic appearances were pre-incarnate appearances of Christ. That is contradictory to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, because the Hebrew law of agency was that a person's agent is regarded as the person himself. So, in that sense... Um, you know, God actually, even if you look at uh, Acts 7, and, and uh, Stephen said that God spoke through the angel in the burning bush. And so we believe that God used angelic appearances and to speak in his name and to speak the direct words of God himself. But the angels were not God, just as the prophets were not God. How do, how, how do um, 
uh, oneness uh, deal with uh, those passages and what Jesus says concerning the Old Testament, speaking about him, because there's no, you know, no, no uh, of the the, the, mo the books that Moses wrote, he doesn't mention the name Jesus Christ, not once. But here it says that he wrote about him, and um, and then Jesus says Isaiah, you know, uh, saw, you know, Isaiah saw my day. No, that was Abraham. I pray, Abraham saw my day and was glad in it. Hey, uh, John eight fifty eight, and then he says that Isaiah saw his glory. So those are all kind of um, what, what we would think inferences to his, you know, uh, hidden appearances in the Old Testament. How, how did they deal with that? I mean, they, they, uh, no doubt you just said that they believed that those angels were real angels, real created angels. Okay. Um, okay, you asked uh, numerous questions. Uh, well, Isaiah saw his glory uh, in the sense of, number one, God has glory. Jesus pre-existed existed as God. He also saw the man Christ Jesus predestined glory. Uh, Isaiah 33, 5, uh, he saw Christ's future ministry of miracles in Isaiah 33, 5. He saw Christ's future virgin birth as Emmanuel, God with us in Isaiah 7, 14. He saw Christ's future name being given to the Son of God as the mighty God and everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, 6. He saw Christ's future ascension to the everlasting throne of Yahweh in Isaiah 9, 7. And 1 Chronicles 29, 23 calls the throne of God, the throne of Yahweh, the throne of the Lamb. So there's only one throne in the New Jerusalem, which will be called the throne of God and the throne of Lamb. And so I also wanted to comment, you said that John 1.18 should be translated as, I believe, the only begotten God. The only begotten God. Yeah, but yeah. I, I researched this. There, there was a few early Alexandrian manuscripts. It came probably from the time of Origen, and Origen liked to say that there were two gods. Uh, you can find throughout his literature that there were two gods. And while certainly Trinitarians don't like to say that. But if you look at the history, a large number of the early 2nd and early 3rd century church fathers, such as Irenaeus, Clement, and Tertullian, quoted John 1.18 as son and not God. This is especially weighty when we consider that Tertullian argued ag aggressively against the modalists, like me, that Jesus was another God person of a trinity. If Tertullian had a text that said uh, the Son was the only begotten God, rather than only begotten Son, in John 1.18, he certainly would have quoted it. But instead, he always quoted the text as the only begotten Son. So there is no use of the phrase anywhere else in the Greek New Testament, but the phrase is used by the Apostle John in John 3.16 as only begotten Son, John 3.18, only begotten Son, and 1 John 1.4.9 uh, is only begotten Son. So, I believe that uh, the historical I, I don't have any, shows I don't have any problem son. with using the term only begotten son. Yeah, uh, yeah not at all. Just, yeah, it, I mean, and I'm sure that they didn't, uh, but I'm just, I just know that the oldest manuscripts, we have the majority text, um, reference it as monogenes theos, and so that's why I, you, you, I think in your debate you used the NASV, and the NASV actually uh, agrees with that translation, the yes, only begotten does. God. Yeah, I, I, I would like to add one thing. Uh, I, I, um, Mr. Ritchie made a number of statements in regards to the patristic, and um, I do agree with them. In a number of places where, um, where God the Father is referenced in the Old Testament, we have a, a number of fathers um, sometimes attributing certain prophecies to Christ. Um, but again, in Justin Martyr and Tertullian and a number of them, they do this for the very point of pointing out that Christ was God Almighty, not, but here's a, here's a clear distinction. In the exact same verses, they make a humongous distinction in, in the fact that Christ and God the Father were two distinguishable persons. This is clear in all of the theology, regardless of them attributing any certain passage to God the Son. And again, we don't have the time today, though, but... I think we will get really deep to that once we have a debate on this topic. We'll find that modalism is not anywhere remotely in the early church other than to, uh, unfortunately, to call it a heresy. I see, one, I see a caller popped up, and so I just want to give them our opportunity because we're down to, like, the last 15 minutes of the program. Sure. And so, um, caller, I, I see you right there on my switchboard. If you want to go ahead and ask a question of either William Albert or Stephen Ritchie, you can go ahead and just press 1, and I'll just click you right on the switchboard. Otherwise, I, I, I guess 
you just um, uh, listening to three Joes after a debate, you know, um, <laughs> basically um, exchanging ideas. But um, uh, I just want to give you an opportunity, call of that, because I see you on the switchboard, to go ahead and uh, ask any questions or, or, or if you have anything you want to share, go ahead and do so. Um, yeah, so um, we have a debate for June 20th. And um, and uh, I just uh, I'm really really uh, thankful for you know you two guys and, and and choosing this as a platform for your debate and and um, looking forward to maybe any other debates on any other topics that might stem from it. I, and uh, I I will give the, the the oneness Pentecostals credit on one thing is that they have three of the finest musicians and Christian music <laughs> and you know who I'm talking about right Stephen Ritchie well there's quite a lot of anointed musicians in one of Pentecost oh uh, I'm talking about Phillips Craig and Dean both all three of them are one of Pentecost pastors but that they have correct? some yeah. of the, they have some of the best music that will really just have you just um <laughs> and on the floor in worship. I mean, yeah, a lot of people don't know that they're oneness. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, and you, you know what? And and they they walk right up into a lot of Baptist churches, and they're just completely oblivious that they just invited three oneness Pentecostal pastors in there. But <laughs> their music is fantastic. It is, and, and it I. Is I, I'm a pastor of a Baptist church, and I play their music. In fact, we're planning on playing one of their songs tomorrow for worship. So it's just, um, I mean, they have just really, really music that will, will, will take you into the heavens. It's just really, really beautiful music about God. Uh, so, um, and you and you wouldn't even think, you know, I, I guess, and, and, and the oneness and Trinitarian position is so closely related that um and that they both essentially do believe in the deity of Christ but they believe it in a different kind of way and so in that it's like it's really really a difficult uh subject to divide upon but um it's just uh you know it's it, it, but it, it once we know you know each other where we stand on those things there is division just, just there to make but a, a, a quick comment i have um I just had about three different people text me saying that they got knocked off the show and they were going to try to ask a question to Mr. Rich. Oh, really? Yeah, I, they I, tried I, I, calling back in, but they cannot I hear the show now. Oh, you know what? Because, you know why? Because we're after the two hour. Oh, the, okay. after, after the two hour limit. And so after so the two hours, yeah, there's the only there's people that will be here are the people that have been here. Can I uh, comment on I, the one question you had asked about face-to-face -face and the angelic appearances in the Old Testament? Right. Uh, is there time for that, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got, we've got, you know, uh, about 10 minutes left. Okay. Uh, yeah, you had asked... Before we get... Before we're forced to be put off okay. because they will knock yeah. us off. Well, yeah. I just want to point out that the word face-to-face -face is not always literal. For instance, in Deuteronomy 5, 4 through 5, Yahweh spoke to you face to face at the mountain. This is Moses writing. Spoke to the Israelites face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire while I, Moses, was standing between Yahweh and you at that time to declare to you the word of Yahweh. For you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. This is referencing uh, Exodus chapter 20 with the giving of the law. So, the Israelites didn't actually see God face to face. Uh, that's metaphorical uh, a use of being close to God or near to God. So the patriarchs didn't actually see God face to face. It just meant that they were close to the glory of God. And, and God was revealing himself to them. It didn't literally mean face to face. Because uh, 1 John 1.18 says that no man has seen God at any time. That means all of God. If a pre-incarnate God the Son was just as co-equal as God the Father, then he'd be just as radiant and glorious as the Father, and no man should be able to see him either. Because God, it says right. no man has seen God, not just God the Father. So the Son should not have been seen if he was a co-equal God person in the Old Testament either. Well, I think that's the thing about it is, um, and I think that that's something that you really need to um, learn a little bit about Trinitarian um, 
theology, uh, Mr. Ritchie, is that is that um, Trinitarians believe that there's subordination within the Godhead. Yeah, and so, yeah. yeah, and so, um, and so, the fact is, is that they are co-equal as far as their deity is concerned. That is correct. Not, yes. not about their authority. Um, uh, you know, the, for example, uh, the, the son does. The, everything the father, everything the father does, the son does. But and uh, and everything the, the 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 son does, the father does through the son. But the son is still the one who is the active um, uh, messenger, mediator of those things. Now, there's there's something that I, I do want to ask you about, though. Um, that you did, you did mention was that you said that the son is the Holy Spirit. And I just wanted to get uh, where you gather that the Son is the Holy Spirit at times. Okay, there's many verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, The Lord is the Spirit. You go down six verses down and you find Paul writing, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. So since Christ Jesus is the Lord, Paul calls him the Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I could go on and on. John right. 14, uh, 17. And Galatians 4, 6 says, The Spirit of his Son is sent unto us, crying, Abba, Father. Right. Um, because yeah. well, if we are to truly believe that God became a man, he had to have become a human spirit, not just in flesh. He had to become a real man. So God entered into a new existence that he never had before the incarnation. And so that human spirit of Christ, according to Ephesians 4.10, ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so the human spirit didn't fill all things as that different mode or revelation of God before before the incarnation because God entered into a new existence it's in that sense that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father uh, in a physical body that was resurrected interceding for the Saints according to the will of God while also indwelling in our hearts as the Son interceding to the Father so we're not denying a plural manifestation or a distinction we're saying there's only one true God who is the Father and there's one man who is the full incarnation of that God becoming a man and it's in that sense that the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings too deep for words I think I think the problem I think the problem there and, and I, I agree with what Mr. Ritchie said that uh, Christ must have a spirit and I think right when he says that I think that's when he goes off point by right. trying to connect a bunch of other verses, he's connected to that. And the irony is that in that very fact, that refutes him because Mr. Ritchie is not understanding the way the term spirit is being used because spirit, <clears throat> the term pneuma, is used at times in a generic sense. At times it is used for a person. At times it is used for the very spirit of Christ. And I think, for instance, in Romans 8, 9, I think Mr. Rich is confusing exactly what he said. Christ, if he became a person, must have a spirit. So I think Mr. Rich is confusing that very fact at times by saying Christ having a spirit, when we read, is interpreted as, okay, Christ must be the Holy Spirit or vice versa, when really the language of Scripture does not allow for that interpretation. But then he goes about, he goes a little bit, in my opinion, off the deep end, attempting to connect a bunch of other verses that say things that are completely different. If we read the verses in their context and we study the grammar, they just don't fit a modalist type of theology in any way whatsoever. And in particular, Romans 8-9 does not fit a modalist theology whatsoever. And when we do debate, the Church Fathers uh, in June, I can't wait for that, but we do, we will examine Romans 8 9, we will see that this verse was never interpreted in a modalist fashion, especially before the, the Council of Nicaea. Yeah, because yeah, when he was explaining it, I, I just, um, like you said, after he described um, how it was that Jesus was the Holy Spirit, uh, it Correct. went into a completely different theological paradigm that I'm unfamiliar yeah. with. Well, if you if you look and, at um, Luke one thirty five, and, and, and yeah, if you look at Luke one thirty five, I mean it was just, it, uh, but it, it, and it's something new that I, I've never heard before. But it was just right. that's yeah. why I wanted yeah, you know, I, I to step back and yeah. yeah. learn what I've you heard that from Okay, modalist theology. Yeah, I'd like to explain that. Um, 
The Spirit of Truth is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended upon the Virgin. Luke one thirty five says that the Holy Spirit performed the act of the Incarnation. It doesn't say Heavenly God the Son. And it's clearly uh, spoken of that the Holy Spirit in Matthew one twenty uh, was the Spirit that was conceived in the Virgin Mary. It says that which was conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So it was the Holy Spirit who entered the Virgin to become a human spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit in action. Once God became a man, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, he will always be a man. And Jesus identified himself as the Spirit of Truth in John 14, 17, when he said, the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him. It's act, it almost looks as if somebody Jesus is talking about somebody else. But then he says, he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So when Jesus said, I will come to you, he said that he is the Holy Spirit of truth. So that collapses yeah, the entire Trinitarian yeah, doctrine we, uh, of the third person. Yeah, it's, 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 but we understand that passage in a different way. Yeah. With I, use, I, use, I often use that passage to describe the personality of the Holy Spirit as a person because Jesus describes the Holy Spirit yeah. as alios. Of like and I just want to point out. I just want to point out one thing that again, again, uh, it's just a complete. Um, it's a complete misunderstanding of what Luke one thirty five is saying because when it says, "And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit," and I'm reading the NAS, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Uh, the Greek term here is "epeskiazo," uh, which is literally to cast a shadow. It's not to literally speaking of going inside of. So again, we've got a misunderstanding of the terms and basically attempting to create a doctrine and running with it when well, the grammar doesn't allow that at all. Well, Matthew, really, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, 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 I think it's very interesting. Well, um, gentlemen, we, we, we have to get off the air here, but I just really want to thank you both for your time and um, thank you and for um, uh, the time. And hopefully, we'll get more callers in on the second debate in June um, to call in and. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll uh, see you guys next week. I just remind everyone: next week we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have James Walker from Watchman Fellowship, Watchman dot org. He's the president there, and we're gonna talk about the Hebrew Roots Movement. And um, William and I we talked about uh, Sabbatarianism a week ago. So this is really along those lines with uh, with uh, uh, groups that really uh, legalistically um, stick to the Old Testament. They're basically um, Reverse Marchionites. So they they stick to the Old Testament, and they, they well, well, they are modern day Judaizers. And um, Hebrew Roots Movement is becoming very, very popular in the Black community. Um, and um, so you know, it's going to be a, a really good educational program on the difference between legalism and grace. And so um, uh, we'll see you all next week. And check out our archives at www.blogtalkradio.com backslash healing the letter X and outreach. And um, uh, just for both of you to know that uh, the link is right there and you can use it on any websites that you want to use. Um, it's in the advertisement. So, uh, Mr. Richie, if you wanted to post it on one of your websites for today's debate, you can go and do so. Well, thank you so much. God bless the both of you. Have a great day. You're